on the throne, amen, and the increase of his kingdom knows no bound, it's forever increasing, and so though the kingdoms of this world may be being shaken right now, we know that his kingdom is one that is unshakable, and we're in that kingdom, hallelujah. Thank you so much, uh, Sue, for leading us in worship, that was beautiful. Isn't it amazing that we can come right into the presence of the Lord and enjoy the Father, enjoy communion with the Godhead through the Son, Yeshua, through Jesus, our Messiah. Look, I'm going to um, share with you, I think I'll be sharing this week and I'll be sharing next week with you, so I like that because now I can sort of split up a longer sermon and not just um, preach at you for two hours. And um, <clears throat> But I want to share with you guys something that has been, um, I've been carrying in my heart for a few years now, but I really believe it's a prophetic word and something that we're coming into more than ever before. Um, <clears throat> I love looking at the, uh, some, of the, uh, some of the patriarchs, some of the men and women of old. I love looking into the Old Testament and, and drawing out the nuggets. And so we're going to do that today. But I feel like the nuggets that are going to be drawn out um, are going to be so uh, applicable for where we're at. I feel like it's so applicable for this season. It's so applicable for um, what God is going to do in this hour. I, I feel like when the enemy wants to come in like a flood, when we see darkness arise, um, we know that this is a time for the church to arise and shine, for the light has come. Amen. Actually, why don't we turn there quickly. Isaiah 60. Arise, shine, for your light has come. He's talking to Israel, and he's also talking to us as believers now, those who are sons and daughters of Abraham through faith in Jesus. And the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. For behold, darkness shall cover the earth, and thick darkness the peoples. But the Lord will arise upon you, and his glory will be seen through you. Amen. You know, I love the fact that when we look into the Old Testament, we look into the stories, even the time of Jesus, where we see darkness, we see like, in the time of Jesus, the Roman Empire, King Herod was so severe what he was inflicting upon the Israelites, upon the Hebrews, upon the Jews of that day was so intense. I mean, he was happy to do a full genocide of um, Bethlehem, kill all the babies when Jesus was being born because he was so concerned about his control. That is, you know, we're seeing things like that in our society. We're seeing people... Um, wanting to put and inflict control on society like never before. We might see our, like, um, our rights being taken away. But in those moments, in these places of darkness, um, the Lord says this is where the church gets to arise and shine. And the reason why is because His glory, His glory is going to be seen upon us. Amen? And I don't know if you've been looking around the world to see, but in the midst of even the coronavirus and uh, the economic upheaval within the nations, there is a stirring that's going on in the body. And the reason why this is, is because we are of an unshakable kingdom. You see, there should be, even as the kingdoms of this world are being brought down, there is a kingdom that is continually advancing, and that's the kingdom of our God. Amen? And so I'm believing for that, and I, I just wanted to look at some passages today. Um, specifically, I love the story of Gideon, so I'm going to take you there. So why don't you turn to your Bibles in Judges chapter 6. And uh, I feel like there's some beautiful parallels that the Lord wants to show us, even today, um, with what was happening back then in the time of the Judges with the children of Israel. Now, if you, many of you know that you know, the Old Testament, the stories of the Old, um, are shadows and types for us to follow now as believers. And so you, know, you can see the children of Israel coming out of Egypt. We know that Egypt is represented as the world. They came out into the wilderness, being led by the fire by day, the, sorry, the, the cloud by day, the fire by night. We know that represents the Holy Spirit, where they went through the Red Sea, which represents baptism, and they're going into the Promised Land. They come up to Mount Sinai, and they're given the covenant, which represents now the new covenant that we've been given. And so all these shadows and types are for us as believers to draw upon, looking through the lens of Christ, the lens of the Messiah, that will actually build life and spirit into and encourage our spirit in these times and seasons. Cool? Well, um, actually, let's just invite the Holy Spirit. I know he's here already, but let's just once again invite him to speak to us. 
Lord, we thank you that your word is a two-edged sword and it divides between the marrow and the bone, Lord God. And so we ask that you would come and you would, you would cut us with your word, that your word would come and pierce our hearts, Lord God, that your word would come and reveal truth, Lord God, that your word would come and would liberate us, Lord God, in Jesus' name. As we read this, would you come and would you speak to us? Would your words go forth today? Um, would your prophetic, go, um, prophetic words go forth today in Jesus' name? And may like the things that you have to say in this time and this season, may they, may they capture us, may they remain with us, may they be like seeds in our hearts that bear forth uh, a great harvest, a great yield of fruitfulness in our lives in Jesus' name. Amen. Cool. So let's kick it off. So judges, the children of Israel now come into the land. Remember, they are not, um, they're not a democracy. They don't have a king. They're a theocracy. A theocracy is where God raises up leaders and he's actually the king over the children of Israel. And originally this, is, this was God's heart for the nation of Israel, that they would, they would go to raise up people, but they wouldn't have a mediator, that they would actually live before him as a kingdom, as, a, as, as he called them, a priesthood, and as priests before the Lord, that they would actually be ministering to him. And so the book of Judges is this book of stories of God consistently raising up people to save um, men and women to save his people, the Israelites. And so we get to the book of Judges and, you know, um, you know chapter 6, the children of Israel have wandered from the truth and they've started to embrace the gods of the day, the gods of the enemies, the gods of the kingdom of darkness. They've started to embrace those things. And guess what? You know, I just love the fact that God is a jealous God, right? He doesn't let his children embrace lies and carry on. He's so jealous that he actually allows us to um, experience experience suffering that we might actually see and discover the truth of God. Amen. He he's so concerned about the gold of his people that he's willing to put them through fire. And so I, I want to encourage you, even as believers, like I don't. I, he's a good God, but he's he's so good that he disciplines us. I think that's something we forget in the goodness of God. Sometimes you're not sure how good your father is in the midst of discipline. Hebrews 12 talks about the fact that God disciplines us, that he loves us and he disciplines us. And so here we see, it says the people, let's start in verse 1, it says, The people of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord gave them into the hand of, the Midi- of Midian seven years. And the hand of Midian overpowered Israel because... Of Midian, the people of Israel made for themselves dens that are in the mountains and the caves and the strongholds. And you think about this, seven, seven years in, in Hebraic thinking is, is a completeness of time. It's a fullness of time. Um, seven represents, um, just like it represents fullness. It's a seasonal thing. It's, it's a seven days it took to create creation and then he rested. And so we see this time where God is like handed over his people to Midian for a season but in the midst of that, he's already preparing because when you come into the eighth year, guess what that represents? That represents a new season, a new life. It represents um, eight represents eternity in the in the kingdom principalities in the in the biblical mindset. And so he's handed them over for seven years, and the hand of Midian overpowered Israel. Because of Midian, the people of Israel made for themselves the dens that are in the mountains, the caves, the strongholds. For whenever the Israelites planted crops, the Midianites and the Amalekites and the people of East would come up against them. They would encamp against them and devour the produce of the land. So, so, so get this, that they would go and sow their crops, the Israelites. They'd go, they had their fields, if you remember it, they were allotted land. The tribes had their own lands and they were allotted that land and it was given to them. It was given to them, their children, their children's children, in fact, um, they could sell that land, but after the year of Jubilee, it would be returned to them because that was eternal promise that was given to their people by God um, and given to their families, right? But what we see is these families are going and sowing each year, and then who comes up and gathers? The Midianites. The Midianites are gathering their hard work, their labor. And it says, <clears throat> they'll encamp against them. And they would devour the produce of the land as far as Gaza. So Gaza is like south of Israel. So that's all the way through the fertile land. 
if you know the nation of Israel, so the further north you go, the greener and lusher it gets. And Gaza sort of goes right down into the Negev de desert, and there's not much that grows past there. So what's that saying? He says, the whole land is completely overrun by the Midianites. It's devoured like locusts. They've consumed everything in the land. And they would leave no sustenance in Israel. Wow. You know, there is an enemy out there that wants to kill, steal, and destroy. Jesus said that he's like a roaring lion seeking those that he can devour. Now let's ask a question. Whose land was it? Was it the Midianites land? Before the Father, eternally, whose land is it? Even today, the children of Israel, they'll always be. It's, it's a land that he's given today. The fact that Israel is back in the land is because of God's promises to those people. God's promises to one man, Abraham, who by faith chose to obey God, leave his home and go to the land that he was going to be given. Isn't that phenomenal? And yet today, God is still the keeper of his promises. A lot of people ask me, how can you know? Tell me, do you, like, do you have proof that God exists? And we can pull on a whole lot of different things, right? You can pull on miracles that you've experienced. You can pull on um, encounters that you've had. You can pull on um, all sorts of things. But I want to tell you one of the greatest prophetic statements of a living God is the nation of Israel. You know, where are the Midianites today? They don't exist. No, that's right. Where are the Amalekites today? We, do we still have Amalekites all hanging out? No. What has remained? It was that Mark Twain said, the, he said, people have come and gone, but the one thing that remains is the Jew. Yeah, that's right. And, and I want to tell you, that's not because the Jews are great at what they do. In fact, many times they've almost been wiped out, obliterated. My family, I've got Jewish, were completely destroyed. Most of my family, was, um, my extended family, died in the Holocaust in the war camps, in those concentration camps in Poland. My family escaped into Russia. My grandparents both did. And I want to tell you that it is God. The fact that I'm sitting here mm. is because God made a promise, and He is a promise keeper. Amen. Right? right. He, he's a promise keeper, but there are seasons where God allows things to take place because He want, you know, He's not just interested in blessing us. The blessing rests on relationship with Him. Now, that's the key. That's right. Like... So I don't think anything has really shifted. The covenant shifted. But God's heart and intent for humanity from the garden was that he would walk with us. Right. That his dependability, that he, that he created everything within his culture, within his nature. And, and, and the father depends upon the son and the son depends upon the father and the spirit guides both of them. They're united and they're continually not living independent. And he created humanity to come into the same relationship, which was the meek would inherit the earth. What's meekness? It's dependent. We need to humble ourselves. We need God. We need to walk with him. We're not independent. We're not trying to do this religious thing, try to be right so that God's pleased up there with us and we can get through life. No, he wants us to be his children. And Jesus said to his disciples, you have not because you ask not. What does that say? It says the father wants you to live a life of consistent dependability upon him. In fact, in James, he rebukes the wealthy and the rich. He says that they have been robbed. He says grieve because you don't depend upon God like the poor do. Meekness. And so what we see here is. What have they done? They've, they've taken the gods of the Midianites. Now, it's really interesting. You know, Midian has actually turned up in the Bible before this. You guys think of where Midian's been spoken of before? I'll let you guys think about it for a second. Let me give you a little hint. Have you guys heard of Baal of Peor? Yep. It's been actually referred to multiple times as this terrible crisis point that the children of Israel had just before they entered into the land, the promised land. How about a guy called Balaam? Have you guys heard of Balaam? Yeah. Oh, maybe this one. Maybe in Sunday school you heard of a talking donkey? Yeah. yeah? Okay. Sweet. So the children of Israel are on their way up to the promised land. They're almost there, right? And they've, they've fought all these different people and God's delivered these, these nations into their hands. And then there's a people group. Um, I think it's mentioned... <clears throat> it's in Numbers 25, but just before that, a few passages before that. 
um, there's a people group called the Midianites, and the Midianites team up, the kings of Midian get together, and they realize that there is something that rests on these people, the children of Israel, and it's not their firepower. It's not their ability to have a great army. They don't have a whole lot of chariots and horses. They realize that the blessing of these people rests on their God that they serve. You know, I love that with, with just before, um, if you guys remember in Mount Sinai, just before the children of Israel left Mount Sinai, they worshipped the, the idol of Baal. They put up that calf and God had said to Moses, he said, Moses, I'm going to send an angel with you. I'm not going to keep going. He was so angry. First, he was going to destroy them and said, I'll use you, Moses. I'll bring a generation out of you. And Moses says, no, you remember your promise. He intercedes and then... Then God says, well, I'm not going to go. I'm going to send an angel. And then Moses intercedes with God again and says, I'm not going anywhere unless you go with us, God. And, and what he says there is he says, because the thing that distinguishes us as a people from everyone else on the planet isn't our good works, isn't the law that we obey, isn't the, the, the way that we eat. He said, the thing that distinguishes us from everyone else on the planet is your presence. Amen. Good. The defining factor, the thing that separates humanity, it separates as believers, the thing that should separate us from the other people on the earth isn't the fact that we're good people. That we're kind people who are generous or, you know, we don't get easily angry. Or the thing that separates me from everyone else is I don't swear. Well, I'm going to tell you, there's a lot of good people out there in the world. In fact, um, many non-believers would tell you that they've met a lot, met a lot more nice non-Christians than Christians. And that's because often we've made Christianity about what we do instead of the presence of the one that's called to, who God has wanted to rest upon us, to walk with us, to know. The supernatural activity of heaven on a human being is a thing that dif differentiates humanity, the, the children of Israel, I believe Christians, the, the church is what differentiates, dif dif separates us, makes us different from everyone else in the world. Because there's a lot of people with great religions. There's a lot of people, you know, that you get that question, how do I know that you're God, what you believe? See, the thing that separates us isn't what we believe. Mm. So good. It's the presence of God, that the Spirit of the living God that lives within the Father, that searches out His thoughts, that knows His intentions. Who can know the thoughts of God? Well, he, we know it now because His Spirit that searches out His thoughts has been placed within us, has been given to us. Isn't that awesome? And so we're getting back to this. These, these, these nations, the Midianites, realized that it was the presence of God, the blessing of God, that enabled the children of Israel to go from victory to victory, to see the nation of Egypt at that time completely come to nothing. It wasn't because they fought them. It was the presence of God that rested upon these people, that when you touch these people, you touch the living God. And so they realized, they said, what can we do to, to remove the blessing off these people? So they get this, this prophet called Balaam and they, they hire him. They say, we want you to come and curse the children of Israel. And God says no. And then he goes anyway. And God says, okay, if you're going to go, you're going to bless them. And then an angel of the Lord stands in the way because he's money hungry and almost strikes him down. Anyway, he finally makes it there and he's overlooking the nation of Israel camped, he's up on this mountain, he overlooks the nation of Israel camp there with the Midianite kings, and he starts to bless them. He can only bless them. Isn't that amazing? I, I just want to tell you that the devil cannot curse you. No, that's right. Because Jesus went to the cross, he died on a tree. Because in the Torah, it says, every man who's killed on a tree is cursed. There's multiple ways that Jesus could have died. The Father chose for him to be crucified on a cross, on a tree, so that the curse will be broken for you and me, so we cannot be cursed. In fact, it says, every blessing now is yours through Jesus Christ our Lord. 
I don't care what it is. I don't care if it's generations, if you've had um, masons in your background. It's the cross that delivers the blow to that curse. It's not repentance of those. I don't think. I don't believe it's going back and trying to repent over those different lines. Because if it's a cross plus something, then it doesn't work. The importance of it, I totally believe in prayer ministry. Absolutely. If it brings us back to the power of the cross. I don't believe in prayer ministry that Jesus plus something. Goes through all these prayers and then you'll bind it and then you'll be finally free. Because guess what? You'll never be free if it's Jesus plus something. We can never stand and go, no, I'm going to actually stand against this curse in my family, this thing that's coming against me, because I know that because of Jesus, I'm under the blessing of the Son of Heaven. I've entered into a new blood lineage. You've been born again. No longer born in John 1 says, according to the will of man, but according to the will of God. Hebrew... uh, 2 Peter 1 says that we are now partakers, the seed of God, the spermata of God has been placed inside of us, that we carry His seed. We are now co-heirs, we are of the lineage of the living God. And I want to tell you, we've started to realize that when you start to throw that back at the devil, when he tries to come because he steals, kills and destroys, he only trespasses and he tries to trespass on a human life and you start to throw back at him the power of Jesus and the fact that he was crushed on the cross so that he was crushed by Jesus at the cross, those those curses, those things that he's trying to bring upon your life break off because they hold no ground. His only power is if you don't believe in that and you believe that it's something you have to do. Because then it's all about how well you do that and how many times you do that. And gosh, I need to go and do some more prayer ministry to get free from this thing. You're just living in the lie of it. And we can see here so that he tries to curse, that Balaam tries to curse the children of Israel and he can't. He just blesses them. So the kings are angry. But then Balaam comes up with a new idea. And he realizes actually the blessing of God rests on the children of Israel worshipping the one true God. And so, if you you want to put your finger in there or have a look at it afterwards, turn to Numbers chapter 25. And we read about this curse that starts to come through the children of Israel, this plague that starts to go through the children of Israel because the men of Israel are taking the Midianite women and marrying them. And in this marriage, or even just like sleeping together, but doing it in sort of an idolatry sort of setting where they're, you know, the, these sexual rituals were all part of their pagan worship at the time. And there's this plague that goes through the tent. It says a, a Levite goes and takes a Midianite woman and takes him into her tent, takes her into his tent. And it says the anger, the fire of God comes upon a guy. He's a, I believe he's a priest called Phinehas. And Phinehas grabs a spear, and with the zeal of the Lord, there's a plague that's wiping out the children of Israel. He, he, he actually stops the plague there. He, he calls it out, he exposes it, and pins it down. And he actually, um, he actually obeys the law in that time. Because it says in, in the law that they were supposed to be, anyone who was to worship another god was to be cut off from the children of Israel. And so he actually does it. He enforces the law, and at that point where this man and woman are killed. It's tragic, but it also shows you how demonic sin can be and corruption and adultery can be in the body of the Lord, in the body of God. And so he, he stops it, and the plague stops there, and, and that's called the Baal of Peor, and it's this significant time. And so this is where the Midianites come from. Their mindset, they understand they're a spiritual people that have this concept of that, that victory is not so much about um, the amount of armies you have, it's, it's who you worship, right? And so, move on. A couple of years, a couple of maybe, 50, uh, maybe 100 years or so, and here we see the same Midianites now coming back and forth and taking over the land of Israel. Who, it was their land, it's theirs. Judges, uh, so Joshua chapter 1, go and possess the land that I have to give you. Be strong. Do not be afraid. I will be with you. 
No, very similar to the great commandment. Go into all the world and preach the gospel. Don't worry about what adders try to bite you. Don't worry about persecution. I will be with you. I'll never leave you nor forsake you. My spirit will go before you. will have signs and wonders. Go. The mandate's just stretched now as believers. God wanted a land, but that land was always to be the land. The, the world to be to, for us to go and subdue the earth under his kingdom, under his reign. It's an invitation for believers. I believe like, at this time, I just, I, I was just beginning, there's, God is putting the teeth back into his church. You know what? He, he's not interested. It's been for such a long time. The church has sat back. And we've, it says that they've gone into their strongholds, into their caves, into their fortresses. And we've built these big churches and God's on the inside and the world's on the outside. And we're all about trying to protect people from getting from one Sunday to the next. I hope you make it back next week. I hope you survived the week, guys. Did you get through without the devil taking you out completely? I'll come back in, you know. And we make them dependent upon a Sunday service and make them dependent. They've got to come back and eat here because the only food they can find is in the house. There's, the devil's reaping everything out there, everything we're sowing, he's reaping. And there's this victim mentality. We've, we've fallen into this place where the greatest thing is our strongholds. We, we rely upon them. When his kingdom is not a kingdom of strongholds. It's not a kingdom of caves. It's not a kingdom of denominations or church structures. It's not what we see in the book of Acts. We see churches invading regions, going from house to house, taking over from one part of the island through to the other. They breached all the way through. Get to the end of the book of Acts, and Paul's like, I, I'm sorry, Romans, Romans, I think it's Romans 28. He says, they, I have no more work to do here. I finished. There's no more work for me to do in this region now. I finished the job. Preached to all of Asia. He said, I've sown where other people haven't sown. I'm going to sow in someone else's field. He goes, I'm on my way back. I'm going to come and see you guys now. And so we see that here. I, mean, I read this, and, I, and it's been stirring in my heart. I, I'm so excited. I don't know if you've been seeing it. And I know there's a whole lot of politics in America, and it's crazy. But when you start to see these Let Us Worship campaigns, where the worship's out there on the beaches, in the fields, where it's an invitation. It's like, actually, the kingdom of God is for our region. This is not just about our survival. We're okay. But the harvest isn't. It's ripe. Someone else is reaping it. Because we've created an understanding. We actually fear the gods of our enemies. It goes on to say, For they would come up with their livestock in verse 5 and their tents, and they would come like locusts in number. Both they and their camels could not be counted, so that they laid waste the land as they came in. I just want to tell you, if your focus right now in this season, I've had to, it's really about your focus. You don't have to look very far. Just lift your head up, look over the hill to see the multitude of work the enemy's doing in our society. Um, you don't have to be a prophet to be able to call it out. It's not very prophetic to say, you know, there's deep darkness that covers the earth. Like, everyone can see that. Oh, it's prophetic when you start to see the greatness of God. That's right. The prophet can see not, you know, the prophet is like the, was it a prophet Elijah who said, you know, that the city was surrounded by an army and his servant's sitting there going, what are we going to do? And he says, open his eyes. And he opens his eyes and he sees the angels of the heavenly armies encamped all around them. More of those that are for us than those that are against Amen. us. Amen. And so, and so, the prophetic is, is able to see what God's will and his power in the midst of deep crisis. So good. But I feel like there's a call right now for believers, and I, I want to take it on board myself, to, <clears throat> to start to prophesy and, to, and start to give my attention, my focus, to what God's doing in this hour, and what he wants to do. What his call is. <clears throat> it goes into verse 6. It says, Israel was brought very low because of Midian. And the people of Israel cried out for the, 
for help to the Lord. Oh man, like, unfortunately in the West, in many ways, the church has been brought very low. Religion. I believe that there's believers all through the different denominations and streams from Catholics all the way through to Pentecostalism, but there's a lot of corruption through all of it as well. And in many ways, the enemy, the, the world looks and says, the same gods that you have are what we have. You've just sort of pushed some charades around it. Um, the world worships, the, what is the Western world worship? We worship money, success. Comfort, power, institutionalism, we worship that. Time, we worship that. Ease of life, the kuna matata life. It's a wonderful phrase, it's the kuna matata. We worship it, we worship it. Everything's okay, we want an okay life. And then we just slap Jesus on it and go, Jesus came to do these things for you. And we've created theologies around the fact that, you know, we've used the goodness of God to allow us to seek after things that we're never called to live under. That force us into caves and strongholds, that that rob us of the power and the authority of God. Rob us from possessing the land. You know, let's look at this passage here, 1 John, quickly. Because, you know, I was thinking, what, what is it? What are, what are some of those gods? What are, no, I'm, I'm, I'm calling these things out on my own for myself. For myself. 1 John 2.15 <clears throat> Do not love the world or the things in the world. Man, we just... Wealth. Wealth is something of this world. If we just want to be wealthy, you know, get to heaven. Well, God, I paid my mortgage off in record time and put my all my kids through a private college. Um, you know, I think I did really well. God's not good. That's not his kingdom. Like, it's great to look after family, absolutely. But he also promises to look after us. Right. He says this, if anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes and the pride of life is not from the father but is from the world and the world is passing away along with its desires but whoever does the will of god abides forever desires of the flesh the desires of the eyes the pride of life they're gods in our world and they're gods that we've set up you know, we've created Christianity, we've created programs around what you look. You've got to look presentable. You've got to be up there and you've got to be a good looking person on the stage. And I'm probably not a good example of that because I am very good looking. But, um, <laughs> but <laughs> sorry, it's supposed to be a joke. But, but what I'm saying is we've created it around, again, presenting a false pretense. It's a, we've, we've created it around being an, a, a motivational speaker that inspires people. Let's just get everyone, let's get the best person that we get. People who just like, it tickles their ears. They're just going to be encouraged. They'll get through the week. They'll pay their tithe and we'll fill this place up. And we think that's revival when the world out there is being reaped by the enemy. You know, we're okay as long as our church pews are full. Who cares if the people down the street are starving and hungry and dying and committing suicide and living on hell on earth. It doesn't matter. That's not my problem. I'm doing my job. My cave's full. My stronghold's full. We're okay. Guess what? Check out our Baal. Guess what draws the people here? The same thing that draws and is destroying everyone else out there. We just painted Jesus on top of it. I'm just just so excited because I feel like we're in a season where it's going to look radically different. But if we want change and we're praying for it, it's not just going to be a little topsy-turvy like turn here and change our steps a little bit. It's going to be a complete overthrow. It's going to be uncomfortable. It's going to come with cost. Someone's going to call it out and we're going to confront this thing head on. And the confrontation that it takes will not be what's outside there. 
What's going on outside our walls is not the problem that is stopping revival in our nation. It's what's going on inside the walls. That's right. So good. We've made it more about us. And we want, we want, we, 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 we prostitute the work of God for our brands and our logos. And God works and then we want to slap our name all over it. We take the glory. And it stops revival. He uses the foolish things, the weak things of this world to confound the wise. He he does this so that no man would glory in his presence. 1 Corinthians 6, I think it is. Okay, sorry. I'm just, I'm excited. And as I said, I'm preaching to myself because I feel like this... What, what the invitation of God in this hour in our region, let's not think massive, let's just think Frankston, right? Let's just think Frankston right now. Are we willing to be yes to the Lord right now? Because it's going to look radically different. <clears throat> Praise God, I've got like two weeks to preach through this. We'll hopefully get through the end of the chapter, right? <laughs> Okay, so it's verse 7. Oh, so Israel was brought very low because of Midian. And the people of Israel cried out for help to the Lord. Suddenly realized we're not called to be independent. This is not about us doing work for God. We actually need Him. We, we need to walk with Him. He, he's the one that's going to be get the glory for our lives. He's the one that creates the blessing. He's the one that gives the land into our, the, into our hands. He's the one that brings his kingdom to earth. He's the one that is invading and going after the poor and the needy. He's the one that we need. He's the one that's really good at his job. He wants to partner with us and he won't do it without us. When the people of Israel cried out to the Lord on account of Midian, the Lord sent a prophet to the people of Israel and he said to them, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, I led you up from Egypt, brought you out of the house of slavery, delivered you from the hand of the Egyptians, from the hand of all who oppressed you and drove them out before you and gave you their land. And I said, I am the Lord your God. You shall not fear the gods of the Amorites in whose land you will dwell, but you have not obeyed my voice. Do you know why you worship a God? Do you know why you have idols in your life? It's not because you just go out and go, oh, I might just worship you. You're like, it's because of fear. Fear is a driver for, driver for idolatry. Fear of provision. Fear, fear of being left out. A lot of like media these days, a lot of our world, um, the way that we sell things is fear driven. Fear of FOMO, missing out. Man, I need to get that lipstick so I can look like that, so I can be have a loving relationship. Like, honestly, that's often how things are driven. It's like, if I don't have that thing, if I don't have that car, then I'm not successful enough. I'm missing out. FOMO, fear. He says we're not to be afraid. In fact, God hasn't given us a spirit of fear. So if you struggle with fear in your life, I want to tell you that's not from God. And if it's not from God, it only comes from one other place. It's from the devil. And don't tolerate, you don't have to tolerate fear in your life. We're not called to, to live. He hasn't placed a parcel, a, a pocket in humanity where he's like, and that's where fear is going to dwell. And it's going to be really healthy for you. It destroys you. It makes you choose the wrong gods. It, it stops you from walking in faith. And it makes you vulnerable. It makes you believe that you're independent from him, that he's a long way away. It's not true. Now the angel of the Lord, verse 11, came and sat under the terebinth at Ophrah, which belongs to Joash the Abazerite, while his son Gideon was beating out wheat in the winepress to hide it from the Midianites. So if you know um, the nation of Israel, it's built, the nation of Israel is sort of like has hills and valleys. And so the hills are where often the cities were built. Right? Um, right now, they're not living in cities, though. They're living in caves and strongholds in the mountains. But in Israel, even today, all the cities are built on top of hills. Uh, you go to Europe and stuff, they're all built in the valleys often, because that's close to water. But in Israel, they're built on hills because it's all about protection. You know, to see the enemy come. 
And, um, and on top of those hills are also built threshing floors. Because threshing floors is where the wheat is brought up to the top of the hill, the wind's blowing, right? And then you thresh the wheat, you need to be up in a hill, hilly space where, so the, the, the chaff can be lifted up, and it's thrown into the air, and it's blown, right? And the heads of the seeds drop to the ground. It's, everyone gets to see it through the time of Israel. You, during the time of harvest, all the hilly spaces were converted to threshing floors. And even today, you can find all the threshing floors in Israel. They're up on high spaces, high places and tops of hills and mountains. But why is Gideon not there? Because he's hiding, right? He's stolen from his own field that he planted, that they sowed into, and he's stolen a couple of heads, and he's in a wine press. Now, wine presses are not top, on top of hills. They're more in valley places. They're in crevices, and you'd, you'd build up a wine press, and it would be in the rock, and you'd squash it down. And it's a really hard place to thresh wheat because there's no wind, there's no ruach. You know, in Hebrew, ruach is not blowing there. And so you're trying to use a wine press, which is for crushing. And the worst thing that you want to do, you don't want to crush, do you know you don't want to crush wheat? You don't want to crush the heads. You want to grind them, or you want to grind the heads, but you don't crush them. And so it's very hard to try to get the chaff out from the, from the actual heads of wheat. It's very difficult, it's challenging. I reckon, like, um, I reckon, like, when I think about some of these things, I think the fear of man has really taken some of the teeth out of the church. And when we try to do evangelism with the fear of man and the fear of society, or we try to do it in a way that's, you know, um, just sort of not upsetting anyone, we're not trying to, we're just trying to be um, relative, or you know, we're trying to make people understand what we're about and cool. It makes evangelism, harvesting, very difficult. Because we're doing it in the wrong place, in the wrong way. Anyway, so Gideon's there and he's beating out wheat in the winepress to hide from the Midianites. And the angel of the Lord appears to him and said to him, O the Lord is with you, O mighty man of valor. Oh. <laughs> What's Gideon thinking? What's his first, first thought? If you were told, okay, like, hey, you've got some enemies there, you've gone and stolen from your own own um, field, you've snuck back with your tail between your legs and now you're in a wine press in the valley somewhere trying to scrub out a few heads of wheat to make some flour for your family. And he goes, mate, you are such a brave and mighty man. The Lord is with you. <laughs> exactly. Confronting, right? It's almost like him, he's being sarcastic, right? But in fact, he's not. He's actually just calling out the truth of Gideon. He's calling out Gideon's identity. <laughs> and Gideon says to him, you can hear it, but he's, he's like, feels like he's been mocked. Please, if my Lord, my Lord, if the Lord is with us, then why has all this happened to us? And where are all these wonderful deeds that our fathers recounted to us, saying, did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt, but now the Lord has forsaken us and given us into the hand of Midian? You know, the way, I feel like there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of good things that are happening right now. Um, but there's also a lot of challenges that are taking place. And there's two sides. I see people just recounting the revivals of old and thinking it's all over. Red Rover, like, we're just going to live in the past. Well, I remember those days when it was good and we just hang on now. We're going to try to get through this. But there's also this uprising that's taking place of people with new faith and going, no, enough is enough. Yeah. At least Gideon's out there trying to do something, right? I remember this. I remember feeling so frustrated when I read this passage. It was quite a few years ago when the Lord started to speak to me about this. And I remember going, God, I feel the same thing. I, at that time, it was, it was probably um, almost 12, 13 years ago that God's been talking to me and I feel like this passage has been coming to fruition in my life. It's been a journey of God speaking to me very much like this around identity, calling things out as calling um calling things that are not as if they are. Which is faith. The invitations, calling out the truth of reality. And he says, You're a man of valor. The Lord your God is with you. Wow. Uh, I think like that's a beautiful recipe for revival. If you have sons and daughters of God 
who have courage and they know that God's with them. What else do you need? Mm. He says, I'm going to give Midian into your hands. And so he says all these frustrating things. And I remember pouring my heart out to God saying, well, God, I haven't seen revivals. I mean, in my age, I saw a small move of God in the 90s. It was interesting. We saw a lot of the Holy Spirit moving in the church. But as far as like breaking out into like community, it was very limited. It was very church-based. It was awesome. I remember rolling under, underneath like seats and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. I loved it. But in many places, it became quite swampy. It didn't go outside the church. It didn't, it, didn't, um, it didn't take regions. It wasn't like the Jesus people movements that I'd heard about in the 70s. It wasn't stuff that I'd read about you know, in the early 1900s, in the, the late 1800s, of where it was just men and women. It was like whole regions being transformed by the kingdom of God. And I just, he, he wants, I, I feel like there has to be a full shift away the Lord's inviting us into a shift that's taking place where he's like, okay, we finally realize that the caves and the strongholds are not where we're called to live. So good. We're called to possess a land. And um, this is, I should wrap up, hey, what, how long have I been preaching for? Yeah, probably two. Yeah. <clears throat> and the Lord turned to him and said, go. Again, he doesn't answer his questions often. I don't know, who's had many questions from God? How many times has God actually just answer you? He's answered me this morning. He did? Awesome. That's, That's it. That's asking a question on the way to hear it. Lord, what is this whole thing all about? Yeah, right. Now you're telling me to depend on him. Come on. Come on. Amen. Yeah. Often I've like asked God's real specific questions, and he just... He gives me a completely different answer to the one that I wanted. Like he doesn't exactly like that. What's this all about? And he doesn't go, well, let me work it out. This is what the Illuminati are doing right now. And this is what's happening here and here and here. He goes, no, shift your gauge. That's right. You know, you're looking on the wrong thing. If your answers aren't being, if your questions aren't being answered, you're probably looking for the wrong answer. Hmm. You know, we're looking often into trying to, what is, what did, um, you know, when Jesus turned to Peter and rebuked him, he said, Lord, no, you're not going to die. And he rebuked him. He says, for your thoughts are on the thoughts of this world, not the thoughts of God. And he rebukes him for that. Yeah. <clears throat> and so he goes on and says, the Lord turned to him and said, go in this might of yours. Go and save Israel from the hand of Midian. Do not I send you. Guys, there's, this is not just going to be one man. This is, this is an invitation I feel like the Lord is inviting the church to arise to. And, and it does start with one thing. And, you know, I, I don't think you can skip this. Because if you don't know who you are, then you'll never grab a hold of the calling that God has placed on your life. Because God sees you as who you are. As you actually are. And the good works that he planned for you coincide directly with who you are. So if you live as an orphan, as a daughter or a son in the, in, the, in, the kingdom, in the king's palace, then no matter what the Father has planned for you, you'll never fulfill them. Because your mindset is below what you actually are. There's an awesome passage. I, I, I just, this one's going to stick with me because I was looking at it yesterday and I don't really look at... Who reads Philemon these days? Yeah? What's it? I'm going to wrap up with this and then we're going to unpack a little bit more next week as we carry on through this passage. But Philemon 1 6. I'll start in verse 4. I thank my God always when I remember you in my prayers because I hear of your love and of the faith that you have towards the Lord Jesus and for all the saints. This is <clears throat> Paul writing. And he says, And I pray that the sharing of your faith may become effective for the full knowledge of every good thing that is in us for the sake of Christ. Mm. What's that? There's another passage. I love it in the King James. I wrote it, um, wrote it out here. How's this? Oh, this is actually from the, um, not from the King James. This is from the complete Jewish version. It says, I pray that the fellowship based on your commitment will produce full a full understanding of every good thing that is ours in union with the Messiah. 
or the King James says, that the sharing of your faith may become effective. You know, the life that we have called our identity becomes effective, our calling becomes effective by the acknowledgement of every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. As long as, like, the beauty of the new creation is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Identity found, like, if you can look into the mirror and look into your eyes and go, wow, Jesus, you live there? That's extraordinary. That's the hope. Because guess what? As soon as you acknowledge that, there is nothing you can't do. That's why we can do all things if we realize he's inside, that we are in union with him. As long as he's external and he's out there and we're a rotten sinner and he's, you know, we're on this journey of trying to get better, then we'll never be able to embrace what God called Gideon to do because we don't believe he's actually with us. We think it's still around performance and trying harder and a process of sanctification instead of being dead to ourselves and alive in Christ. That Christ would put his spirit inside of us and I actually have his desires and I can do what he calls me to do because my identity is his. I love this. And, and this is the way God sees it in Acts. Here we go, I'll finish up with this one. Just have a think about this, mull over it this week. Because my, for such a long time, I was trying to do the work of the Gideon without knowing my identity. And I, activate, act, act, I acted as a victim under the rule of the enemy. And so my lifestyle looked like a man taking a few sheaves and in my own strength, right, trying to thresh them in a wine press. And guess who gets the glory for all that? You. Me. And guess how much I get done? Not much. No. Nah. No, nah. but people will pat you on the back and go, thanks, mate, you've got a bit of bread, and you're the one that brings a bit of bread, and it's encouraging, but it's all about you, and you trying harder, and it's actually disgusting, because what could Jesus saved us from? That's right. But if he lives inside of me, I can't take any glory for it. He put himself, it's the gift. The gift of God. Jesus is the truth about us. His identity that we are co-heirs with him. We're seated with him in heavenly places. We, it's no longer I who lives, it's Christ who lives in us. That's not a journey of trying harder, that's him. In us, that's the beauty of the new creation. In Colossians 2. So he says this, I was, I was reading this here and, um, last night. And so we know Saul is on the way to Damascus, right? And he's been persecuting the church, like very strongly. And then as he's on his way, he approaches Damascus. Suddenly a light from heaven shone around him. He's dragging people into prison. He's killing people. And falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? He said, who are you, Lord? He said, I'm Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But rise and enter the city, and you will be told what you are to do. There's a number of different ways I've read that before. But I love the way that Jesus fully identifies himself as the body. He doesn't separate. He doesn't say, why are you persecuting my people? Or why are you persecuting my gospel? He says, he's not saying, why are you persecuting my teaching or my family? He says, why are you persecuting me? Because Christ sees us literally as his body. He doesn't see it any differently. It's like if someone hurts my wife, he's hurting me. Because we are one. We're actually one. Like what she desires, her protection is fully me. And if someone persecutes me, then it's fully hurting her. And I just love that. But we often don't see that. We don't identify with that. Where it's Christ over there or up there or we're trying harder when he's actually within us. Where the fullness of the Godhead dwells within him. And it says in Colossians 2 that he wants to dwell within us. And so I, I just want to encourage you this week. This is what I like to do. Look into the mirror and look into your eyes. 
Because the eyes are the window to your soul. And say, thank you, Jesus, that you live inside of me. Yes. So you start to acknowledge that. That breaks all the other thoughts of curses and, you know, that you're struggling and you're striving because that's the actual reality. Christ in you, not outside of you, in you, the hope of glory. And we see it here in the book of you know, Judges, Gideon, where in the next couple of next week we'll look at it, where the Holy Spirit puts Gideon on like a glove. It's like a, a, it's a foreshadow of the new creation work that God's going to do. Called each believer to be a part of in our filling, out working His will on earth. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Well, um, let's pray, and uh, we'll do, um, I'm going to pray, and then uh, I bless you guys. Have an awesome week. May this word just strike your heart. May the truth of it strike your heart. Um, Lord, we just say yes and amen to your will. That the same God who is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the same God who led Gideon and the children of Israel out of the stronghold of the multitude of the Midianites, is the God today. You stand, sat in he- you see, you're seated in heaven and you laugh, it says. When nations try to just rage against you and against your people, you sit in heaven and you laugh. And so we just thank you, Lord, that you are victorious. And we ask that we would shift our eyes onto you. And God, I just ask, we welcome the Holy Spirit to come and rock up and change things drastically in our communities, in this region, Lord God, that you would take back what is rightfully yours. Lord, that we would possess the land that you've given us. And Lord, we, we, would you teach us repentance, Lord? Would you show us, Lord God, how to pull down strongholds that are in our own lives, in our families, things that have been put there that don't honor you, that, that rob us from you, Yielding to you and trusting you. Lord, not just for our sake, but for the sake of your kingdom. In Jesus' name. Amen.